Hi, I'm Marcus Blake here at the studio of That Nerd Show, and we are speaking with, uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, since I seem to have lost my notes. I uh, no. apologize. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, my name is Spencer Wilkinson. I directed a film called Alice Street. All right, and we're going to be talking about Alice Street, uh, and for those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, it's basically a small community artist haven in Oakland, if I'm correct. That's right. Okay. All right, well, we're going to uh, jump right into it. Um, are, first of all, are you from Oakland? No, I'm not originally from Oakland. I moved there in, um, what, 2002? So I've been there for a while, but okay. uh, not, grew up, not born and raised, no. Well, I thought this film was actually kind of, uh, very interesting, uh, not just dealing with a small you know, community in Oakland that most people aren't familiar with, but kind of adding to the gentrification problem, as we like to call it, uh, across America. Um, and those, and we're, since we are based in Dallas, we've had our own issues. Uh, I have a little sister who lives in Queens um, who wanted to live in Brooklyn, but you know, faced similar issues. So. Uh, tell us a little about uh, this project and kind of the, the, the central problem that was going on um, with Alice Street. Great. Yeah. I mean, I was uh, living on Alice Street and, um, you know, really aware of all the changes that were taking place in Oakland and especially, you know, learning from those who'd have been around for a lot longer than me. Right. You know, they'd been kind of watching uh, the city change in the, before their eyes. No, in some in, in positive ways, right? I mean, there was a lot of new kind of cafes and restaurants and sure. bars opening up. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the long time, you know, folks that had really kind of created the, the cultural landscape of the city were being pushed out. Uh, right. because the rents were going way up, you know, uh, new luxury condos were being built. And um, I was really interested in kind of seeing how a lot of the locals, especially artists, were um, resisting it, you know, right. and kind of coming up with ways to support people to stay in their community and not be pushed out. Um, and then when I heard about this mural being painted right down the street from, from where I lived, I, you know, I wanted to follow the story. You know? Well, I think, again, it's, it's interesting to kind of follow this path and um, of gentrification. And it always, it's easy to paint corporate developers as, you know, the bad guy that they don't really care about the culture. They care about, you know, expensive property and making more money. Um, do you feel like that's kind of the case with, you know, these luxury condos and things that, you know, we're coming into Oakland? Because it seems to be that way with other cities. And I'm not that familiar with Oakland. Uh, I've been there once. So, but do you feel that's kind of how they looked at it? You know, it's interesting because, um, you know, you talk to some of the developers and the way they talk about their project, they're, you know, using a lot of like lingo about, you know, uh, supporting the community, you right. know, engaging the community. And, you know, this is going to be a, a, a building for everyone. Um, but right. when you look at the price tag of the unit, <laughs> it's like three times the cost of anyone. Right. Uh, residences around them. So, you know, it really does require um, either really good policy on the city side to ensure that, um, you know, they're creating units that are going to be potentially some affordable units right. uh, for the community or to find ways in which these buildings can actually benefit the neighborhoods they go up in. Right. But a lot of cities are not, don't have the policy. And so in this case, it really required the community themselves to say, no, you yeah. know, we, we need to actually sit at the table with you. We need to get some sort of benefit from this. And in this case, you know, uh, they were able to get very substantial benefits, but it required the community yeah. doing all the hard work <laughs> and showing up at these meetings and um, participating. In well, kind of, yeah, kind of drawing the line in the sand, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Um, the mural, how, how did the mural come about? Yeah, well, these, um, the organization that put the mural together is called Community Rejuvenation Projects. Um, they had made um, like 100 murals around Oakland and the East Bay um, for the couple of years prior to this project. So they had a long history of doing this kind of community right. engagement 
and then painting this murals. Um, in this case, though, it was like the largest mural they'd ever undertaken. Four walls uh, on a very prominent intersection in downtown Oakland. Um, so they had to raise money. They had to uh, come up with a design. They brought the design to community centers to get feedback. Um, we did, they did, and par as part of this, I got engaged and did all these interviews with local community members um, that kind of gave them a sense of what the history was in the neighborhood. Right. Um, and then followed them through their design process um, and then brought that, like I said, design back to those community members to get feedback. So um, it was a really long process. It took them a couple of years before they actually put paint on the wall. Right. found kind of a common theme uh anytime developers want to come in and you know it's for the benefit of the community but really it's about you know a price tag is it's almost kind of like this war on artists and poor people the people that really kind of make up a community and make it you know what's beautiful uh you know you kind of saw that in brooklyn i think new orleans obviously faced a lot of that after katrina uh dallas has had its own um you know, problems with that as well. Do you, do you feel like that's kind of an accurate portrayal, you know, with Alice Street that I can apply to that area? You know, it's interesting because, um, and I think the muralists would say this too, uh, murals can sometimes be a double-edged sword um, because if a community has all these, you know, beautiful murals, um, they're attractive and they're attractive to developers. And in right. fact, in the case of the mural that went up on uh, 14th and Alice that this film follows, the developer said, you know, the mural attracted us to this location. <laughs> <laughs> and that was not what we wanted to hear. <laughs> but, you know, it's the reality of, you know, even though it was very much this kind of like mural that was about anti-gentrification, right. <laughs> it's still very... Yeah. Visually very beautiful and vibrant and attractive. And the developers are like, oh yeah, this is great. Let's build something here that, you know, ironically would cover all four walls. You know? Right, right. Um, so it's interesting. They can play a double-edged sword. They can be something that um, pulls people together to um, resist displacement. And they can also be an attractor to developers. So. You know, in this case, you know, they really were, had this intention to um, use the mural as a way, almost like a shield to development. That was the muralist's initial intention. You know, I don't, I don't want to give everything away uh, for people who will watch the documentary. I mean, obviously they can look everything up online, but um, two questions. How long did this process, uh, from the time you started this documentary, how long was the process of kind of looking at everything? It was almost six years. Okay. Six yeah, I started hours. filming in 2014 and um, and finished in like the very end of 2019. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Um, do you, with, do you feel like, I, I don't want to say that all the problems have been solved. I don't think that's probably accurate, but do you feel like that there has been a common sense solution that has been brought about or is it still kind of an ongoing fight? Um, you know, it's an ongoing fight, but I think that um, what happened with this project and with this mural kind of fight where the community came together is they created a coalition which represented very diverse uh, constituents. On one right. side, you had the Oakland Chinatown community. Uh, on the other side, you have this um, community called the uh, Black Arts Movement Business District. So right. Two communities that live very close to each other, but don't necessarily do a lot of interacting. Um, due to the mural, they kind of came together and formed this coalition that fought for, like I mentioned, community benefit agreements from developers. 
Right. They went on to fight for six other uh, developments, um, community benefit agreements that resulted in over $20 million in benefits directly for that community, uh, which means affordable oh. housing. It means um, uh, being a part of uh, retail advisory boards. It means it had a lot of benefits that came from new developments. And because the city doesn't really have policy uh, in place, um, you know, it's kind of, uh, I think, a very important win that I hope can be inspiring to other you, cities that are dealing you mean, with it. It sounds like community organizing, which is an ugly term to some politicians, actually worked. <laughs> it worked incredibly well, you know, and it's, um, it's something that um, I think could work around the country. Um, and oh, you know, again, I, I, there's if a city doesn't have policy, it kind of leaves it up to the to the neighborhood. Right. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I've seen it in, in other, you know come about in other places. We just kind of like to make fun of using that term and how it gets demonized as some kind of communist action. And I'm like, right. but then on the one hand, some politicians are like, but oh, we want our community to come together. You mean community organizing? <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of just means talking to your neighbors, right? Right. Right. And I that, mean, that doesn't have to be a hot button issue. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's talk about your neighbors. Right. Neighbor, that's, neighbor conversation. That's why you need an affordable bar that you can go to and, you know, do it over a beer. That's, you know, civil. Exactly. So, well, what's next for uh, this film? Are you, uh, you're kind of doing the film festival circuit? Yeah, we are. We've had a really wonderful reception from film festivals. In fact, we're going to Texas next. Uh, we'll be at the Thin Line Film Festival. Oh, that's uh, a good one. Thank yeah, you. That, yeah. Yeah. I'm really that's, excited about that. Uh, it'll be our Texas uh, premiere. Um, and yeah, more festivals coming up. And then we're going to, we actually developed a curriculum around the film. Uh, oh, to help okay. Other communities, um, you know, uh, talk to their neighbors. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, nice. So we have the blueprint in a curriculum um, and we're doing a, some impact uh, screenings and, you know, really wanting to kind of continue to, Get the film out there um, so people awesome. can check awesome. it out at alicestreetfilm.com and learn learn more about it well since we're based in uh texas uh you know uh when we get this up online everything it's um, i'm glad to hear that it's coming to uh you're going to be doing your texas premiere um so i got about time for one question uh and it's going to be your nerdy question we're going to test how much of a nerd you are um uh, so here's here it is if you could have a weapon of choice or a superpower from within the nerd universe to fight the forces of evil, what would that be for you? Um, like a dial up to Skynet? Does that count? <laughs> Always a good one. You can also have like more than two. We give people that are like, well, can I have like I think teleportation, you know, um, especially at this time during COVID, you know, it'd be really nice if I could oh just my like, God beam myself, you know, to the, to the next location. Look, I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for the transporter technology to finally be, you know, from Star Trek. I'm like, that would right. just be so much easier. You know, we transport beam. anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Beam me over to, I mean, I guess the, you know, Zoom, Zoom kind of helps, but um, <laughs> it'd be much better if I could just. I mean, can you imagine cutting down on the travel time from location to location if we had that? <laughs> I mean, Zoom is I, don't get me wrong, you know, the virtual thing is, is kind of helpful in some regards. It saves it a lot on, on flight, flight costs. So. Right, it definitely is. <laughs> uh, but I mean, just think about all the shots you can get done in one day if you didn't have to, if you had instant travel. Oh my gosh, no <laughs> kidding. Yes. So, well, um, great film. Um, I think it does speak volumes to, you know, gentrification problems uh, throughout the country. It's in bringing attention to another area that's very much like, you know, areas in Texas and New York and places like that. Um, so, and I like how you guys have a curriculum to kind of go with it, uh, you know, what talking with your neighbors and, and how to, you know, community organize. We don't think that's an ugly word here to, you know, get things done. 